let me start with my theory of great power politics, then go to the American experience, and then talk about the rise of China. My theory starts with five simple assumptions about how the world works. You take those five assumptions, you put them in the blender, you hit the on switch, and you get a lot of trouble. <laughs> okay? So let me tell you what the five assumptions are. The first assumption is that states are the principal actors in international politics, and they operate in what is called an anarchic system. Now, when you use the word anarchy, for most people that means murder and mayhem. That's not what it means in international relations speak. Anarchy is simply an ordering principle that says that there's no higher authority that sits above states. It's the opposite of hierarchy. Anarchy means that states are like pool balls on a table with no higher authority above them. Okay? So when we say the system is anarchic, we're not saying it is a rough and tumble system. We're simply saying that there's no higher authority that sits above states. The UN, the League of Nations, come on, let's be serious, right? States are the principal actors in the system. Assumption number one. Assumption number two has to do with capabilities. And there the argument is that every state in the system has some offensive military capability. There's no question that there's great variation among states in the system. If you were to take a country like the United States, take a country like Israel, take a country like Britain, uh, these are countries that have a significant amount of offensive military capability. If you were, on the other hand, to look at countries like Belgium or Jordan or Guatemala, these are countries that have remarkably little offensive military capability, but they have some. So my argument is that all states have some offensive military capability, although some states have much more than others. The third assumption is of enormous importance, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on it, just so we're perfectly clear, because it does a lot to drive the theory. And the third assumption has to do with intentions. Second assumption had to do with capabilities, offensive capabilities. The third assumption has to do with intentions. Here, the argument is that states can never be sure about the intentions of other states. And they certainly cannot be sure about future intentions. Now let me unpack this a bit. The reason that it's so hard to assess another state's intentions is because intentions are inside decision makers' heads. And you can't get inside people's heads and see what their intentions are. It's very different than the situation that exists with regard to capabilities. Capabilities usually involve material things, and you can see them and measure them. During the Cold War, for example, and there are a number of old dogs in this audience who remember the Cold War. Remember, we used to, we used to look at the Soviet Union, trying to assess the Soviet threat, and we could always come up with a pretty good picture of what their capabilities looked like. We could count the number of tanks they had, we could count the number of SS-18s, the number of boomers, and so forth and so on. We could assess the quality of them. It was quite easy, quite easy to assess Soviet capabilities. We could never reach agreement on Soviet intentions. People on the left thought that the Soviets basically had benign intentions, that it was the United States that was driving the Cold War. People on the right thought that the Soviet Union had evil intentions, and it was the Soviet Union that was driving the Cold War. We still do not know for sure whether the Soviets had benign or malign intentions. And if you go back to World War I, as you all know, the origins of World War I started August 1914. We're coming up on the 100th anniversary. There's going to be a huge literature that comes out next year, and we're going to debate who caused World War I, and whether or not Germany was responsible. And what the debate is going to devolve down to is a question of what German intentions were in August or during the July crisis of 1914. We still have no agreement on what German intentions were, but we know what German capabilities were. Right? So the point is, very hard to assess intentions. Now if you say, John, I disagree. I think if you look around today, it's not 
easy, but it's possible to divine what another state's intentions are. My Sunday punch is to say, all right, I'll give you that, but you can't tell me what the future intentions of any state will be, because you can't tell me who will be running Germany in 10 years. You can't tell me who will be running China in 20 years. So there's no way you can divine what their intentions will be. So my argument here is that it is very difficult to know the intentions of other states. This is not to say you can be sure that another state will have malign intentions. It's just that you can't be sure. I want to lay out one final example just to drive this home. It has nothing to do with international relations. It has to do with divorce. <laughs> Anytime two people get married, they assume, at least in 99.9% .9 of the cases, that the person they're marrying has benign intentions toward them. <laughs> Otherwise, why would they get married? But as you know, we have a divorce rate around 50%. And in many of those cases, the husband and wife end up hating each other. And in some cases, having really malign tensions towards the other person. All of this is to say that any time you get married, this is a very depressing thought, but nevertheless true, <laughs> you can never be certain that the person you're marrying will have benign intentions toward you for the duration. Again, that's not to say that the person you're marrying will have malign intentions. It's just to say, you cannot be certain what the other person's intentions will be over time. So I've laid out three assumptions for you. One is that the system is anarchic. There's no higher authority that sits above states. That's one. Two is, all of those states in the system have some offensive military capability. Varies greatly, but all have some offensive capability. And three, you cannot be certain about the intentions of other states. Four and five are very simple. Four says that the principal goal of states is to survive. Survival is the numero uno goal of states. This is not to say that the only goal of states is survival. There are many other goals. Prosperity, uh, projecting your values abroad, plenty of goals. But the number one goal has to be survival for the obvious reason that if you don't survive, you can't pursue any of the other goals. So survival is the principal goal. Fifth assumption is that states are basically rational actors. This is the famous rational actor assumption. Another way to put this is that states are strategic calculators. Okay, so four is survival, five is the rational actor assumption. One is anarchy, two is some offensive military capabilities, three, uncertainty about intentions. Those are the five assumptions. You take them, you put them in the blender, you hit the on switch, trouble. Why? Well, the first behavior that you get when you mix up these assumptions is fear. States fear each other. Now the question is, why do they fear each other? They fear each other for two reasons. First of all, they fear each other because it's always possible you'll end up living next door to a state that has got a lot of offensive capability and malign intentions toward you. There's always a chance you'll end up next door to Imperial Germany or Nazi Germany. And the second reason that you fear states is because of what I call the 911 problem. There's no higher authority. It's an anarchic system. So when you dial 911 in the international system, you know who's at the other end? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody's at the other end. It's an anarchic system. This leads to the second form of behavior, self-help. States quickly figure out that it's a self-help system. As my mother would say, God helps those who help themselves. This applies in international politics, right? It's a self-help system. So number one, states fear each other. Again, the level of fear can vary from case to case, but deep down inside, there's that fear. Number two, states understand it's a self-help system. Number three, you understand very quickly that to be Secure, and remember, survival is your principal goal here. To survive in the international system, the best way to do it is to be, as we used to say in New York when I was a boy, the biggest and baddest dude on the block. <laughs> to put it in social science speak, the name of the game is to maximize your relative power. Because the more powerful you are, the less likely it is anybody will fool around with you. How many of you go to bed at night worrying about Canada or Mexico or Guatemala or Cuba attacking the United States? 
You say, this is unthinkable. No country in this hemisphere would dare attack us. Why? Because we're Godzilla. Exactly. The name of the game is to be extremely powerful. In an anarchic system where there's nobody at the other end when you dial 911 and you cannot be certain about the intentions of other states and those other states may have a whole heck of a lot of offensive capability, you want to be very powerful. Because if you're very powerful, you're then very secure. To be a bit more specific, what you want to do is you want to be the hegemon in the system. Now, what exactly does it mean to be the hegemon in the system? My argument is that the planet that we live on is too big and it has too much water for any one country to be a global hegemon. And I believe, by the way, that one of the reasons that the United States has gotten itself into a lot of trouble since the Cold War ended is that we, la we operate under the illusion that we can be a global hegemon. You can't do it. The globe's too big. You get yourself into too much trouble. The best you can do in my story is be a regional hegemon. You can dominate your region of the world. And I'm going to make the argument soon that there's only been one regional hegemon in modern history, and that is the United States of America in the Western Hemisphere. But the name of the game, if you're interested in survival, if you're interested in maximizing your, maximizing your survival, is to be a regional hegemon. That's goal number one. Goal number two is to make sure you do not have a peer competitor. To make sure that no other state dominates its region of the world the way you dominate yours. Now you're probably saying to yourself, why is it important not to have a peer competitor? It's all about the freedom to roam. Now you're saying to yourself, what is he talking about? Freedom to roam. Most of you have never thought much about this, I'm sure. But why is it that the United States is wandering all over God's little green acre, sticking its nose in everybody's business? Why is that? It is because we have no security threats in the Western Hemisphere that we have to worry about. We're so dominant in the Western Hemisphere that we are free to roam around the globe. If we had five or six powerful states in our region and we had bad relations with two or three of them, we would have to focus much more on the Western Hemisphere than we do. So we are free to roam into others' backyards. What the United States does not want is another country to be free to roam into its backyard. So what you want, let's just go to Europe for a second, is you want a situation where Imperial Germany or Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union has to worry about its neighborhood more than the Western Hemisphere. If Germany conquers all of Europe and is a regional hegemon in Europe, it is then free to roam. And that means free to roam into the Western Hemisphere. And the United States does not want anybody roaming into the Western Hemisphere. We want to be free to roam into other people's backyards, but we do not want them roaming into our backyard. And I'll talk more about this as we go along. So the story I have told you about my theory is that starting with these five assumptions, five rather simple assumptions, you end up in a world where if you are interested in maximizing your prospects for survival, the best way to survive is number one, to be a regional hegemon, and number two, to make sure you have no peer competitor, which is another way of saying you want to make sure you're the only regional hegemon on the planet. Okay? So that's the basic theory. 